come to a section of uh, several parables. We were looking at the parable of the sower last time, and uh, this chapter is full of parables, and we're going to cover several of those this morning. Matthew 13, reading from verse 24. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things... Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, He said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Then He left the crowds and went into the house. And His disciples came to Him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. And then at verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Well, please do have your Bibles open at Matthew chapter 13. And as that hymn has just said, God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. So let's pray now that he'll make his word plain to us. Father God, when we look out at the world around us, uh, we are confused and baffled so often. So we pray as we gather around your word just now, that you would make your ways plain to us. You would show us what you're doing in this world and that you'd encourage our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Divisions in the church. The relentless attack of the liberal elite undermining Christian principles. The decimation of Christians in Afghanistan and Myanmar the rise of Islam in the West, teenagers abandoning the church in vast numbers, sheer apathy in response to any attempt to share the gospel. It begs the question, doesn't it, is God's kingdom a sinking ship? 
or is it more secure than it might look like on the surface? I imagine Jesus' followers could have made their own list of discouragements, things that they found perplexing when they looked out at the world, that didn't seem to line up with their expectations of what the kingdom coming would look like. Why are the religious leaders trying to discredit Jesus? Why are some people not responding to the gospel in the way we hoped they would? Why isn't God's kingdom gathering pace like we thought it would? When we look at the world without Jesus' explanation, these issues can cause real confusion and be very disheartening for any follower of Christ. But Jesus says in verse 35 of our passage this morning that he will open up his mouth in parables and utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. In other words, if we have ears to hear, we, Jesus is going to show us what he is actually doing in the world. Without Jesus' explanation about how the kingdom of God grows in the world, we would never arrive at these truths for ourselves, Jesus says. He will utter to us this morning, as we listen to his word, something that has been hidden. He will reveal what was once not knowable by man's feeble mind. Jesus says that we could never look out at the world around us without his explanation and arrive at the truth that he is sharing with us here this morning in these parables. We'd be left absolutely perplexed and discouraged. So if that's the case, then I guess we'd best listen up to what he has to say then. For what is it that Jesus reveals to us in these parables? How does he correct our expectations about his kingdom coming? Well, let's look first at the parable of the weeds. And here we see that Jesus teaches us that God's kingdom is opposed for now, but God is thoroughly in control. Firstly, Jesus says that his kingdom is going to be opposed in verses 24 and 20 to 26. He says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And Jesus explains the first part of his parable in verses 36 to 39. He says, then he left the crowds and went to the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And Jesus answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Jesus says that he is doing a work in the world for he is the son of man in, in the parable. He is sowing good seed and producing sons of the kingdom. But at the same time, the enemy, the devil, is at work, and he is producing weeds, people aligned with himself, who are against Jesus and his rule, whether knowingly or not. So the kingdom of heaven is opposed for now in this world, according to Jesus. Not everything, therefore, is going to go from strength to strength in the church. Jesus is at work, yes, but sadly, Satan is at work too. That's why some people don't become Christians when we make the effort to share the gospel with them. That's why some of our evangelistic outreaches are a bit of a flop at times. That's why some people stop coming along to church, though you thought that they were Christians. It's because the kingdom is opposed. And Jesus says that will cause his servants to be baffled. It does, doesn't it? It causes us to be baffled. For the servants in the parable were expecting only wheat to grow in the field. They didn't expect any setbacks. Verse 27. The servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? What we see happening in the world and the results not matching with what we might expect will leave us confused just like the servants unless we listen to Jesus' teaching. 
For if you expect the whole world to submit themselves to Jesus and his teaching, then well, you don't have the same realistic expectation that Jesus himself has. That doesn't mean that we should be nihilistic and you know, say people are either going to be weeds or they're going to be weak, and there's nothing really we can do about that. No. No, we must take our responsibility seriously. You should be praying for the events that we're putting on as the church and praying for each other as we try and have these dialogue dinners with our friends and our colleagues and the people we rub shoulders with. We must go after the believer who is straying and try and warmly win them back and not just write them off, say, oh, well, they must be weeds then. But it also means that when we don't see the success we expect to see, that we shouldn't be surprised or allow it to rock our faith in God's great plan of redemption. For Jesus has taught us that the kingdom will be opposed right from the day he inaugurated it, back when he was on earth, all the way through to when he returns. It's going to be opposed. But that doesn't mean that God isn't in the driving seat. The world isn't spinning more and more out of control with God struggling to hold things together. We don't serve a weak and a helpless God, do we? And we don't fight against an enemy who is any match for our God. God and the devil are not engaged in some kind of cosmic arm wrestle poised on the edge of a knife. No, they're not equals. God has his enemy right where he wants him to be. But he holds off, landing that finishing blow for now. But again, you might not perceive that, might you, by naturally looking at the world around you. You might not come to that conclusion, but that's the truth. For example, but naturally looking at the world, you might not think of these things. For example, you look at the violence in the world, the rise of identity politics, the cult of self, like Sandy was saying, churches crumbling under the pressure to conform to the ideals of the world around us. And we think, maybe they are equals, maybe this is poison life, but God says that's not so. So why does God not deal that finishing blow now and make an end to all things that oppose him. The servants in the parable ask the same question, don't they? They offer, offer to gather up the weeds in verse 28. And then Jesus responds in verse 29 and 30 by saying, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles and be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus says that he is not going to deal with those who oppose his kingdom now, for doing so would be detrimental to his church in the long run. For if God acted now and dealt with the weeds before the harvest, before that last day, then it would somehow negatively impact on the harvest of the wheat. Some who are not currently showing signs of being weak might be uprooted with the weeds. God knows what is best, not us. He's the farmer. He's the master farmer in the field. He knows what he's doing. And he will always act in line with what is best for his kingdom and for his people. However, all that we're going to see on the surface is the weed-infested chaos. That's all we'll see. We will never come to the conclusion that God is in control and waiting patiently for the benefit of this church, would we? When we look out at the world and see all the chaos, we wouldn't say it's, think that's his motivation. We wouldn't think, oh, it's okay, God's in control. He's just waiting really patiently. Because if he did something now, you know, it would decrease the yield of believers in the long run. We would never think that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is not slow, and he is not impotent. Instead, he's patient, and in his wisdom, he's chosen to allow these two kingdoms to grow side by side in this age that we live in. And at harvest time, the yield of wheat 
that is God's people who are saved by the Lord Jesus, will be all the greater because he hasn't chosen to act now and put an end to all opposition. You see, if we listen to Jesus, he turns that confusion we have when we look out at the world into clarity. But we're going to face a lot of mess and muddle in this world, aren't we? We see that all the time. We're going to see, have lots of confusion, lots of questions. We're going to see lots of opposition and turmoil according to this parable, and that's what we see for ourselves. But we needn't be discouraged. Read with me verse 40. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. God knows exactly what is going on in his field, and he will make everything right in time. Those things that we've mentioned already, divisions in the church, liberalism, post-truth worldviews, the rise of Islam, the persecution of the church around the world, be assured God knows about them. And he is thoroughly in control. One day, one day the kingdom will be established fully and be completely unopposed. But we have to wait until then. But what else does Jesus want to reveal to us in these parables this morning? Well, if we have ears to hear, then we'll learn this, that God's kingdom also looks rather unimpressive now but one day it will fill the earth Jesus put another parable before them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field it's the smallest of all seeds but when it has grown it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Jesus sandwiches these two small parables between the parable of the wheat and the explanation to add further force to what he has been saying. These two parables are similar to the parable of the wheat and the weed, aren't they? But they're also somewhat different. If the discouragement with the parable of the wheat and the weed was that the kingdom is opposed now, but that one day it won't be, then the discouragement with these two parables is that the kingdom looks, well, rather unimpressive now. And it looks like it won't really amount to anything. But the encouragement is that one day, one day it will. Like the parable of the wheat and the weeds, you wouldn't be able to come to this conclusion without God's gracious revelation. You might think by looking at everything that's going on in church worldwide and the decline of churches in the West, that God's kingdom, his church, is on a downward trajectory forever. You might be even tempted to think that after the year that we've gone through, you might be even more certain of that. But that isn't the case. Think of a mustard seed, just for a moment. One of the smallest seeds you can possibly find. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, that an enormous plant can come from such a tiny, tiny seed, such humble beginnings. You may know the saying, mighty oaks from little acorns do grow. That's exactly the same concept that Jesus is expressing here in this parable. I have a very lucid memory from when I was about six or seven years old and on a walk in the forest behind my grandparents' house. And I remember walking along with my, grand, with my granddad and him saying to me that this massive oak tree, it must have been about two meters in diameter that was behind us, grew from this tiny little acorn that he picked up in his hand. And I remember my reaction to him saying that very vividly. I remember just laughing at him because I thought, you must be pulling my leg. 
There's no way something so enormous and majestic as an oak tree can come from that tiny little acorn. It seems so incredulous, impossible even. And even now, though I'm not six or seven anymore, even now as an adult, I still find it somewhat baffling that something so large could come from something so, so tiny. But it happens, doesn't it? It happens all the time in our world. And Jesus says, so it is with his kingdom. You might be worried that it doesn't look like anything impressive could come about from what looks so unimpressive. I'm sorry, church, but we don't look all that impressive. That's the bad news this morning. But that's okay. A diminished church that is trampled on in the media. The lack of young people in the church and an aging demographic. But one day, we're told, the church will be the biggest tree in the forest. And all the birds will gather and make it their home. Isn't that marvelous? Jesus' disciples must have questioned how this kingdom would fill the whole earth when people were rejecting it left, right, and center in their time. And we might think the same, even more perhaps, because it appears, well, it appears to us, doesn't it, that the glory days of the church are behind us, not before us here in the UK. But mighty oaks from little acorns do grow. And think of the second parable here. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. What else does Jesus describe us as this morning? What's as unimpressive as a tiny seed? Well, incy-wincy, microscopic, slightly smelly bacteria. That's what we are. Leaven or yeast. But isn't the astounding thing about baking bread that when you put this stuff in flour, add some water, a pinch of salt, and give it some time, the leaven does permeate through the whole dough. You don't see it at work. You don't see these little teeny yeasty bacteria things at work. You can't, they're microscopic. But they are working covertly and slowly, secretly. So it is with God's kingdom, says Jesus. Jesus says, give it some time. And what seems unimpressive and not likely to amount to anything, microscopic, will one day be impressive. Everything and totally visible to everyone. One day, the whole earth will be filled with the kingdom of God. God's plan from the beginning of creation to spread his kingdom of Eden, to cover the whole face of the earth, will one day come to full fruition. And if you take a step back and take the long view, as that Radio 4 show encourages us to do, then you can't deny that the kingdom has actually already grown massively and substantially. It may not make the news, it may not register on your radar day by day, but the gospel has secretly broken into nearly every single country, culture, and people group on the planet. You couldn't say that about any other religion or philosophy. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't make headlines, there are no fireworks, but it's secretly at work doing its job. God is secretly doing that work. What this parable doesn't teach us is the mechanism by which all that's going to happen. That's the thing about uh, seeds and yeast. How they work is somewhat mysterious, isn't it? And I imagine the mechanism by which they grew would have even been more mysterious in Jesus' day when microscope, microscopes and plant biology weren't as advanced as they are today. Here, Jesus is not promising a certain rate of growth and he certainly isn't promising any setbacks. The parable of the wheat and the weeds told us that much. After all, yeast, as far as my GCSE biology tells me, grows at an exponential rate. Whereas seeds, from what I can kind of gather from my basic observation, 
they kind of sprout up quite quickly at the start, don't they? And then they kind of slow down after a while. So Jesus is definitely not giving us a formula so that we can track the growth of his kingdom, the growth of his church in the world. We can't plot a graph and work out at this point in the future, that's when the kingdom's going to be fully established if it continues on this trajectory. We can't do that. God, uh, Jesus doesn't intend to give us that much detail. Rather, he simply wants us to know that what looks so unimpressive now will one day fill the earth and people from every tribe and tongue and nation will be drawn into it. The kingdom will come in its fullness at the end, but he's continuing to work, continuing to work discreetly here in our age. There may not be fireworks, but God's kingdom is breaking ground every single day. And here's the thing. If what Jesus says is true, which it is, then that helps us not to become discouraged if we have seen some setbacks where we are and in our time. But the kingdom does not necessarily have to be growing much where we are for it to be growing as a whole in the world. You only need to hear stories of the great work of God amongst the Iranians, not just here in Scotland, um, but elsewhere in the world. They grow, the, the gospel has come to the Iranians in great power. Or the Han Chinese. You don't have to just um, look at those things to see that, this, that God is seriously at work in the world even though here at the moment there's not much going on amongst the Scottish people. There's a great scene in the film The Darkest Hour. I wonder if you've seen it. It's, a, it's really a documentary looking at the life of Winston Churchill during the war. And in that film, at one point, Winston Churchill has, to, has the unenviable task of phoning up an officer in the field and telling him, that the help that he thinks is coming, the reinforcements he thinks is coming, in fact, are not going to arrive. The commanding, the officer in the field takes a deep breath at this news, and he simply responds to Winston Churchill down the radio, saying, received. He goes back to the fighting, he goes back to defending their position, which is being assaulted by the Nazis, knowing that no help is coming, and that they're going to lose where they are. And the reason why he does that so willingly is because he knows that his commander-in-chief is breaking ground elsewhere. Winston Churchill knows that if he sends troops to help that officer on the field in France, that he will not be able to make the decisive push towards Berlin. So the officer, knowing that his commander-in-chief is breaking ground, that his kingdom is advancing, is willing to see, uh, endure great loss, and live in dark times where he is, doing all that he can still, doing all that he can in the, in the war effort, but trusting that his commander knows what he is doing and is making ground elsewhere in the world, that one day the kingdom will be established. Church family, we don't follow an earthly commander-in-chief like Winston Churchill. We don't trust in an earthly commander with limited resources at his disposal. We don't see him pulling down iron railings to make limited numbers of spitfires. We don't trust in an earthly commander who has limited intel, who is struggling to crack the enemy's code. We trust and worship the omnipotent and omniscient Lord of heaven and earth. And nobody can rival him. Nobody can decipher his deep wisdom or undo his plans. So we should trust our commander-in-chief even more than that officer did back in the war, even when we're seeing setbacks where we are. We trust that he is breaking ground elsewhere. So the lesson is, though the church may look like the underdog now, you'd be foolish to write it off. Don't give up on the kingdom because it doesn't look like it's amounting to something because it will do in time. And even now, though we do not see it, God is discreetly at work adding people to his number and nobody is going to stop him. Isn't that an encouragement? 
Isn't that an encouragement to invite your friends along to your house for a dialogue dinner or to some of the Christmas services? God's at work. He's secretly at work, though you can't see it, and he is adding to your number. Well, let's look at our final parable. Here we see that God's kingdom will arrive fully, but sadly not all will be welcomed in. Verses 47 to 50. Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All the parables that we've looked at this morning have had both the present and the future in sight. The only way to think rightly about the here and now, the present, is to think of it in light of what is to come, the future. Clarity only comes in this age, this muddled up and not now and not yet stage, the kingdom coming but not yet fully arrived stage that we're in, by looking at what is to come. And the only way we can know what is to come is to trust Jesus and his words. This last parable, more than the others, has this end day particularly in view. For although it has a lot in common with the parable of the wheat and the weed, good seed being replaced with good fish and bad seed being replaced with bad fish, and um, them being cast into fire or being brought to somewhere safety, There is a subtle difference, isn't there? The parable of the wheat and the weeds focuses more on the mixing of the good and the bad during this age that we live in. And it's more brief about the final separation. Whereas the parable of the net has its primary focus on that separation at the end of the age. What this parable teaches us is that there will be a day in the future where God gathers all humanity and sorts us into two groups, the righteous and the wicked, those who have humbled themselves and submitted to Jesus' loving rule, and those who we saw last week have decided to ignore his teaching and remain willfully blind. The world will not be a muddled place forever. One day we will know exactly who belongs to Jesus and who doesn't. And there are only two possible outcomes depending on what group you are in. The good fish are sorted into containers and belong to the fishermen, whereas the bad are sadly thrown into the fiery furnace. Now, this is going to either be a great comfort to you or a great terror to you, depending on how you have responded to Jesus and his coming kingdom. If you've responded rightly to Jesus and received his righteous status by faith, it's not a work, it's nothing we've earned, then what a joy to finally meet him face to face. Wouldn't that be wonderful? To see his kingdom finally ushered in, that kingdom that we have longed to see all our lives through. That kingdom where there's no more tears, no more slander, no more belittling comments for belonging to Jesus. All wrongs made right as God judges justly and finally rids the world of opposition and all evil. That'll be a glorious day. What a joy it will be to see his kingdom that we so long to see now finally come and be fully established and unopposed. It'll be wonderful. But how terrible the alternative You may be sitting there and said all your life that you want nothing to do with God. You don't want to hear what he has to say. You reject his words. You maybe even feel make his people feel small for trusting in him. Well, on that last day, you'll see that reality come to full fruition. In the here and now, you may say you want nothing to do with God, but you still benefit from all his good gifts that he gives to the whole world. You still benefit from food, from family, friendships, health, 
beauty, music, art, shelter, all these wonderful gifts that God gives indiscriminately to the world. But one day, even that will be stripped away from you, from you, if, you are not, if you do not belong to Jesus. You'll find that you didn't really mean what you said all your life. For existence without God and all his gracious blessings is a terrible thing. A lonely, painful, joyless, resentful existence, deplete of all meaning, purpose, and hope. That's what the Bible means when it talks about hell. So if that is you, or is, if you're listening online perhaps, can I urge you to respond to Jesus' words in verse 43. He who has ears, let him hear. Don't let these words wash over you. Don't put your fingers in your ears because you don't like thinking about such weighty things. There will be a great day of sorting and judgment, and how you respond to Jesus now will determine your future destiny. And as we looked at last week, the more of a habit you make of rejecting God's word, actually the harder it becomes to ever respond rightly to him. Well, as we close, just a reminder that you would never arrive at these truths by looking at the world around you with just your standard eyes. You would think God's kingdom is actually on the ropes and that the enemy is starting to showboat. That's what you think. You would never think that we're part of an enterprise that will one day cover the entire planet. But Jesus says that God will deal with his enemies in the future and usher in his perfect kingdom fully. That is for sure. That is certain. And you know what? He has been right about absolutely everything else in the Gospels, hasn't he? That he would raise Lazarus from the dead, that Judas would betray him, that he'd be crucified, buried, and rise again from the dead. So I think if he's been right about all those things, then I think we can trust him with what is still to come too and allow what is still to come to shape how we perceive the present and keep working now as encouraged people, not disheartened by what we see. For God's kingdom is not a sinking ship. That's good news, folks. It is not a sinking ship. It is sovereignly secure. And God is utterly in control. Well, let's pray. Father God, we confess before you now that we are so prone to becoming despairing. We look at the world, we look at our nation in particular, and we think, where are you? What are you doing? We, we don't seem to see you at work. But Lord, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that you are at work. We thank you that you're discreetly breaking your kingdom into every country on this planet, into every people. And we thank you that we're privileged enough that your gospel has come to us. And help us, Father, we pray, as we listen and allow your word to um, percolate in our mind and in our heart.